get a lot of questions from organizations about when they have to add the integrated behavioral health primary care accreditation. In the health home rule itself, as the overarching rule, it's not currently under deemed status and it doesn't require specific health home accreditation. But there is in uh, paragraph F language about having accreditation for, at a minimum, the integrated uh, care component of health home service. And what the department did in developing the standards is put this requirement in and didn't go forth and develop very specific standards about integrated care. For example, things like uh, certain types of physical health care checks or screenings, examinations. Now, what the, the department's goal is that organizations do not need to have um, an extra accreditation on-site survey. So what we expect is that during the next time you're COA accredited, and the next time that you have a COA accreditation survey, after you've been certified for Health Home, and that you're eligible to, um, for COA to apply its standards, that's when it needs to occur. And basically, it's not something that providers need to worry about. We couldn't get real specific in the rule. And the reason might be if a provider gets um, starts getting certified for and starts providing health home on October 1st of this year. And it just so happens that, and that's the first time you begin providing it, and that's the first time you, you begin providing the integrated care. And if by, because of your COA accreditation cycle, if your COA accreditation survey is going to be October 15th of this year, um, and you've only been providing the service for 15 days, COA may not apply the standards. They're, you know, they usually have a minimum amount of time that an organization has been implementing standards before they would review it. And it's however it fits in with the accreditation um, process. We don't, we don't dictate that. It's, it's each accrediting body has its own policies and procedures on that regard. So in that example, if COA isn't in a position to apply the standards at the October 15th survey, this year, in 2013, then the expectation would be when COA comes out in four years, approximately, so in 2017, that's when we'd be looking for it. Um, so, so in sum, don't need to call an accrediting body and schedule an extra survey, pay for a single service review or any type, just when you get certified, when you start providing the service, and then um, when the accreditation comes and where it fits in naturally. For organizations that are doing um, NCQA or other types of equivalent um, certification or recognition, and I do have on the, uh, the slide there um, that the NCQA patient-centered specialty practice, that is a new recognition that they have in addition to their patient-centered medical home. We recently reviewed that, and that is one that uh, ODMH has approved. If somebody is wanting to use um, an accreditation other than COA, their accrediting body, then that needs to occur within 15, 18 months, and that is um, F2 of that slide. So hopefully that clears up any of the questions in that regard. And I'm, I'm going to go ahead. Let me, as you can see, I'm doing real good here this morning. OK. Uh, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn the presentation over to Melissa Dury. Melissa is the Associate Director of Standards Development for the Council on Accreditation. Um, she has uh, an extensive background in standards and working um, with different types of programs and services. And again, I want to just recognize uh, when I reached out to COA and asked them if they would uh, consider doing this uh, to support the Ohio providers, they were um, very responded very quickly and very willing to do so and having some conversations to see what our needs are. So I, um, I want to give, uh, again, my appreciation to COA and specifically to uh, Melissa. So, and 
Thank you, Melissa. Okay, thank you, Janelle. Um, thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, I'm here today because I, hold on, let me, let me just. Okay, so that should be showing up now for you. Um, I'm here today because I was responsible for overseeing the development of COA's INT supplement, which was released uh, almost a year ago now in June of 2012. And the INT supplement was developed in direct response to a shift we were seeing in the behavioral health landscape, and states like Ohio were beginning to implement legislation around integrated services, and our accredited organizations were coming to us um, to ensure that they would be prepared for these kinds of changes. And, and as a result of the contact we had with Ohio organizations throughout this, they were very well represented in the standards development process. Um, the standards advisory panel included representatives from in, uh, accredited organizations in Ohio, as well as the Ohio Council of Behavioral Health and Family Services Providers. So during today's, my portion of today's webinar, I'm just going to spend 10 or 15 minutes providing you with a brief overview of the INT supplement, and then I'd like to devote the rest of, the, of our hour together um, to your questions about the standards. Um, also, before we get started, I believe most of this group is probably already COA accredited and familiar with the structure of COA standards and our accreditation process, so I'm not going to spend time on, on those topics today. But at the end of this presentation, for those of you who are interested in learning more about COA, I will provide some, some web links and some other information that you can use to um, learn more about COA or our accreditation process or other standards that we have available. So we'll start this overview where the standards start, and that's with the definition of integrated behavioral health in primary care and the purpose standard. The research identifies improved access, reduced incidence of acute illness, increased capacity to manage chronic conditions, and improved overall health as the desired outcomes of integrated services. So you'll see each of these reflected in the INT purpose standard displayed here, which is designed to outline what one hopes to achieve through implementation of the INT standards. This slide also includes the INT definition, which defines integrated behavioral health and primary care as the systematic coordination of behavioral and physical health care requiring an integrated approach to assessing, identifying, and coordinating treatment of mental health, substance use, and general medical conditions. The first note in the definition shown here clarifies that any model along the integration continuum is acceptable, and that includes integrating primary care right into your existing program, um, establishing written agreements with primary care providers that are located on site, or establishing written agreements with primary care providers that are located in your community. And the second note here clarifies that this is a supplement. So it's going to be assigned in addition to all applicable administration and management, service delivery administration, and appropriate service sections. So you'll work with COA's intake staff to assign service sections just as you have in previous accreditation cycles, and, and this will be added as part of that process. When reviewing the section, um, it is important to keep in mind the fact that this is a supplement. So this slide shows the six core concepts that make up the INT supplement. But because it's a supplement, the assessment core concept, for example, must be implemented in addition to assessment standards that you will be implementing as part of an assigned service section like mental health. So once you get into the standards, you will notice that the focus of these core concepts is really on the practices that are unique to integrated programs. And this minimizes any potential redundancy between the supplement and the relevant service section that was also assigned. Today I want to focus on how the INT supplement supports several key practices from the integrated literature, including expanded access, patient engagement, screenings, care coordination, and information management. Additional practices that are supported by the literature, like using evidence-based interventions, culturally and linguistically appropriate practice, or um, involving the family and service planning, are covered in other COA sections that will be paired with this one. So we won't talk about them today, although they were considered as part of the development of this section. So the first practice I'd like to highlight is expanded access. And INT 103 is the standard that directly addresses this recommended practice. 
The standard requires that the organization offer expanded access to meet the needs of its target population. And then the interpretation provides some examples of ways to implement that practice, such as same-day scheduling or expanded hours or taking advantage of alternate forms of communication. The next practice supported by the INT section is patient engagement, which really starts at the very beginning when you're setting the philosophy and mission of your integrated program. The service philosophy for the integrated program should be both holistic and person-centered, with the client as an active participant in his or her treatment. And this requires that the client be a primary player in the assessment and service planning process. Additionally, the client should be empowered through education and support to manage his or her chronic condition and advocate for um, his or her service needs. These practices are really critical to achieving improved overall health, which you might remember from the purpose standard, is a key objective for integrated programs. Um, a brief summary of some of the practice standards most relevant to screenings are included on this slide. Um, integrated programs should have a standard list of routine screenings that are being conducted at the point of the assessment and then updated regularly throughout the duration of treatment. And the result of these screenings should be used primarily to identify concerns or ineffective treatment. And then this allows the provider to make any necessary adjustments to the individual service plan when the goals are not being met. And that might include um, stepping the individual up to more intensive services if that's needed. But another use of screening is to inform health promotion activities. And health and promotion activities should be tailored primarily to the needs of the individual. But aggregate health data on the client population as a whole can also be used to identify areas of needed education. And this is outlined in um, standard INT 503 listed here. For example, knowing that a large portion of the population is overweight or obese might inform the type of health education activities that are covered in your health promotion program. Um, INT5 is the core concept devoted to the health promotion activities. And this slide focuses on the care coordination piece of integrated care. And this really begins with the assessment process, which identifies the individual's behavioral health, physical health, and social service needs. And that then informs the development of an integrated service plan, which incorporates their service needs in all three of those arenas. Um, and then the rest of the slide focuses on the practice standards within INT4, which is the care coordination core concept. And the key components of care coordination addressed by the standards um, include, first, the makeup and interaction of the interdisciplinary team. This includes establishing clearly defined roles and communication guidelines. Um, second, the service coordination itself. Um, this includes things like transition planning and establishing clear referral procedures like documentation and follow-up requirements. And finally, third would be tracking progress, which as we've discussed before, ensures the effectiveness of the intervention is being tracked, as well as the individual's um, ad adherence to medication and um, treatment. And the final practice that I wanted to talk about is information management. And these systems are really critical to successfully implementing the other practices that we've discussed. Perhaps most prominent is establishing systems for linking behavioral health and primary care providers, including shared access to the client's health information, um, standardized documentation techniques that use common terminology that everyone can understand, um, and clear systems for tracking referrals. Information management systems will also be key to effectively tracking the results of those regular screenings that we discussed on the earlier slide, as well as medication and treatment adherence again. Um, and that's outlined in 410. RPM is noted here because there's a clear connection that these information management standards in INT have with the standards found in RPM, like information and technology management or case records. I also wanted to mention PQI here because INT 104 requires that the impact of integrated services specifically on client outcomes be incorporated into the organization-wide PQI framework. And tracking program effectiveness and the achievement of positive outcomes is really prominent in the integration research, so it was intentionally included in this section um, as well.
And finally, there are four fundamental practice standards in the INT supplement. Um, the first two relate to client rights, and they're INT 106 and INT 107. And together, they ensure that the client is aware of the services that are going to be made available to them and the relationship that exists between the behavioral health and the primary care providers that are on the integrated team. Um, this includes making sure the client truly understands how information will be shared and his or her right to refuse or decline integrated services. INT 108 is um, primarily related to risk, and it only applies to organizations that are actually taking a fully integrated approach and hiring medical staff to provide the primary care services on site. Um, the standard requires that proper insurance be in place for all the services being um, offered directly by the organization. And the standard corresponds with a standard in RPM that requires an organization to purchase sufficient insurance. Um, and then finally, related to client safety is INT 302. And this ensures that a crisis plan is developed as needed to guide the client and their family in the event of a crisis. And this standard may seem familiar to some of you who have completed MH in the past because it closely resembles a standard found in MH6. Um, it was included here to ensure crisis planning was considered regardless of which service section was assigned with INT. Um, so, but a crisis plan, of course, developed for the MH standard also satisfies the standard here. So that should give you sort of a, a brief introduction to the section and a general idea of how INT, um, the section, supports key practices found in the integration literature. And I'd now like to open the floor up for your questions, and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, I can actually link us here to the standards themselves. So, um, you know, as your questions come up, if they're related to specific standards, we can go visit it together. So are there any questions about what I've covered today, or did you come with any specific questions about the standards themselves? And I, I know Janelle and her team are also prepared to answer any questions you might have about um, her portion of the presentation at the beginning. That's correct. And if people want to, um, so if you want to type a question in, I can read it here. You've got the box there to type uh, the questions in, and um, I can read it out. Or if somebody wants to raise their hand, um, Certainly, like you said, and I'm here, uh, Afet is here. I, I think I said that earlier, I hope. Obviously, I get the, when I have technical difficulties, it just uh, throws me off a bit. So any questions that people would have? Because if, if nothing else, if you want continuing education, we, we want to support that, uh, that hour. <laughs> The, this, while you guys are thinking about that, this slide has some of the additional information I mentioned as well. Um, the COA website is here, and you can get a lot of great information about COA and the accreditation process and the other standards that we have available. Um, the training calendar is also um, linked here, and that's a new website. It's really easy to find trainings on different topics. Many, many, many of them are free. Um, we have self-paced trainings and pre-recorded webinars and live webinars, and you can participate in any of those free of charge. And we've actually have had an exciting partnership with Relias Learning Center um, to develop some self-paced trainings, and the topics that are currently available on the website are listed here, and those are all free as well. So for those of you who, are, who aren't as familiar with COA, if there are any of you, um, these, those are some good resources to get more information. All right, we have our first question. Okay, here. great. So um, it's, a, it's a great question. How do you suggest monitoring medication compliance? Um, uh, that is a really great question, and I, I actually may not be, oops, sorry, want to find, um, see if I can find the best standard that relates to that. I think it's in here. Hmm. All right, I can't find the standard now that has that. 
while I'm on the spot here, but um, I actually, I don't know that the, the INT standards themselves aren't very prescriptive in how exactly you need to monitor that kind of thing. Um, so it would be, it would be a, a procedure or a process that is internally developed in your organization and probably in partnership with the primary care portion of the team. Um, and, and as far as COA is concerned, um, you know, any, any, whatever internal processes you develop that make sense for your service population and your environment um, will satisfy the standard. Oh, there it is, um, 410. Care coordination includes mechanisms to track medication and treatment adherence. So it's the standard, from an accreditation perspective, we don't um, dictate exactly what that has to look like or which practices you have to use to do it. And Fed, I don't know if you have any, you know, sort of, and as Melissa is saying, it's not prescribed, but mm -hmm. I don't know if you have any sort of yeah. suggestions or. Sure. Um, I, I, first, I want to say good morning to everyone, and thank you for participating on this webinar. I also want to thank Janelle for actually planning, uh, uh, organizing this webinar in support of the health home service, and I want to thank Melissa for, again, giving her time to uh, provide this overview of the COA, the integrated care standards. In, uh, in addition to what Melissa shared, I just want to point out that in our uh, performance measures for the health home service, these are uh, state um, and uh, federal uh, mandated outcome measures that each health home has to comply with, and that includes actually tracking data, monitoring uh, data, and reporting data to the state. One of the uh, performance measures is related to medication adherence. Uh, and on our list, it appears as a proportion of days covered. This is a measure that the state will be tracking based on the pharmacy claims data, and, uh, and we will be actually tracking, you know, uh, the, uh, the medication adherence based on how well uh, the prescriptions have been filled, if there were any gaps between the prescriptions, uh, uh, you know, filled. Um, uh, uh, for a list of uh, conditions that we identified in our health home project uh, for each health home enrollee. So that is an important outcome measure, and uh, like you said, it's one of the state mandated measures we have on our uh, 27 uh, measures of list. And um, so uh, again, we are not prescribing a certain way to do medication adherence. Uh, there's flexibility and creativity, but we will be providing input and feedback to the health homes about how they are doing with the medication adherence measure um, for their health and clients. Right. Thank you. Thank you. The, the next question that we have is, are there any standards related to meeting the quality measures for health homes, or are there any additional PQI requirements other than those provided by CMS? And I'll, I'll read that. Um, since the question's come up here, and I'll read that one more time. Uh, for Melissa's benefit and for everybody. Are there any standards related to meeting the quality measures for health homes, or are there any additional PQI requirements other than those provided by CMS? And the standards don't um, explicitly talk about meeting, um, you know, state mandates like that. Um, the, like I said, they do require that you're tracking data, um, and and that it certainly will be informed by whatever the state is asking you to track. Um, so we will look to see that you're tracking the impact of services and that you have integrated that into your agency-wide PQI um, process. But other than that, there's no other standards within INT specific to meeting those state requirements. All right. And this, um, and then the next question, just for clarification, if we are COA accredited already and we are going to do health home, we will need to add it at our next accreditation review. And I think, you know, from the um, from the ODMH perspective, it's at the next time that you're eligible in accordance with um, COA's policies and procedures. And and Melissa, I, I guess as a question for you, I think when an organization, they're already COA accredited and they're coming up for their renewal, is there, um, does COA want to see at least six months of a implementation of standards before it um, applies accreditation or is there a certain amount that, because I think there is, and I'm, yeah. I'm not sure if it's six months or 
Yeah, it is six months, Janelle. So when you go through the intake process, um, and you have your conversation with Rebecca Tedesco, who does all the intakes for organizations coming through COA accreditation. She'll ask you those questions about how long you've been seeing clients within this integrated program, and if it hasn't been six months, then as Janelle mentioned earlier, it, you'll just it'll be put off until your next accreditation cycle. So it's it's something now, and and we base it in our rule. It is based upon your certification date. Uh, and now COA would look at it. Now, if an organization, some organizations are already doing integrated care, behavioral health and primary care. So perhaps they started that on March 1st. They get certified by ODMH on October 1st for Health Home because that's the first date you get certified based upon your county. And then if you're, so at that point you already, you have been providing the service for six months in this example, and if your COA survey is November 1st, you know, COA would apply the standards because you've been providing it for six months. So not to confuse it, but it is just, it's just based upon when the organization starts providing it, and then you know, our rule had to speak to the certification date. Uh, are there uh, any other questions that people have? Yes. I uh, let's see. I have a question. If an agency is accredited by the Joint Commission, does it also have to obtain COA accreditation? Is and that would be um, no organization. You know, right now the Department of Mental Health does require. An organization, if you're providing um, certain services, then the organization has to be accredited and have the behavioral health accreditation prior to applying for certification with the department. But you don't, you, we only require one. There are some agencies that have more than one accreditation. We also, when we develop, um, the health home rule has the standards and then when we put the language in um, Administrative Code Rule 5122-2502, which speaks to the accreditation requirements and even some of the dates there, we recognize the, the differences um, in what the different accrediting bodies had um, had available. You know, COA, and we know I had a conversation with COA, and I know the Ohio Council had approached them, as Melissa talked about, and they did a real bang-up job at um, developing these standards and working with the, the industry to get them in place. So, but, okay. Any more questions? Perhaps, uh, perhaps in spite of, uh, in spite of all of those issues earlier, we may um, end up on time. I am going to, if people, if you want to think about anything, as I said, I want to sort of reiterate the continuing education requirement component because we are doing it a little bit different this time. If you, um, if you want CE and that was asked on your registration, we and you, you can get it one of two ways. If you've logged in, we will get a registration report and that will show that your participation. And if there was more than one pers uh, staff person from your organization, if you all viewed this together at one per using one person's registration and sign-in, then you can fill out that training report, scan it, and email it back to Debbie Swank. And in the email that you received with the PowerPoint, you would have her information, or you can mail it back in to her. And then we will send out the evaluation um, and the post-test. And again, there is a post-test this time, and it will be graded, and then as long as it's passed, then we can issue the continuing education certificate. And I think for those, for going forward for all of our webinars where we're doing continuing education, expect to see the post-test. So hopefully, if you have any questions about that, it's, it's just a little bit different. But if you missed it before, we were just trying to respond to um, organizations that like to you know, gather together and listen to the webinars. 
right. I don't see any more questions coming in. I do not see that anybody's hands are raised. So we will go ahead and uh, end this um, webinar. I appreciate everybody's participation. And again, Melissa, thank you for your willingness to do the presentation. And I appreciate everybody's patience with uh, the technical part of it. So, thank you. Thank you, right. everyone, for coming. All right. Thank you, and have a great uh, weekend.